The scripture reading for this morning uh, comes from uh, Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. May we give our attention to it. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And now for our Old Testament reading as well as the sermon text today, uh, Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and we will read through the entirety of the chapter Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the field and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, She is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about you and all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all that she wanted and had some left over. 
As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Ascends the reading of God's holy word. Please pray with me. Our God, this is your word. And we ask that you would speak to us. And we ask that you would use your servant in a mighty way, that you would uh, unhinder him, that you would uh, freely speak. And we ask, God, that you would bless the hearers and the speaker. And we ask that you would uh, be with us even now. In Christ's name, amen. One song that has uh, always fascinated and interested me is a song that has uh, been around for a long time now. It's been written uh, many, num- many years ago. And I wouldn't say it's one of the greatest songs of all time or anything, but the song does express a problem that is too universal to ignore, to make light of. And as you hear this particular song, it repeats these very simple and yet very profound words. It says this. It says, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. And it repeats this phrase in different ways again and again. And I don't even know, honestly, if that song sings another line or not. But over and over again, you hear these words. I can't get satisfaction, driving home the point that satisfaction is elusive. It seems like it's just around the bend and it cannot be found, that it is just outside of this particular man's grasp. This man cannot find fulfillment. He cannot find contentment. Wherever he goes, it eludes him. And this man is longing for something that seems never able, that he seems never able to reach, never to be filled, never to be contented. He is never able to find that which actually satisfies. People of God, as the book of Ruth unfolds before us, Naomi especially finds herself in a very similar place as this. Naomi, we've seen already, believes in God. She believes that he is sovereign. She believes that he rules over the world supreme and is in control of her her and the world at large. But she believes that he is not a very good God. She believes that God has been cursing her life as though Uh, You know, her own choices had nothing to do with where she is now and what has happened to her in the past. She believes Yahweh is some sort of uh, cosmic policeman looking for her to make her next mistake so she can smite her down. And the question then, as the text unfolds around Naomi, is will Naomi find satisfaction in her God? 
as the rest of Israel has found it all around her? Will she find rest in a God, this rest that she has been looking for and longing for her whole life and has always been looking for it in the wrong places? Will she find peace? She has gone looking for satisfaction in Moab. She has looked for satisfaction in her husband and then her sons, all of which have left her feeling more empty than the last. And now the question is, will Naomi be filled? Will she be taken care of? Will God provide for her? Will he be gracious to her? Even as he has already been so to the rest of the house of Israel around her. Will God bless her? Even just a little bit. Is there any grace left for this broken bitter woman and this Gentile woman who has returned home with her. Our text opens up, and the first thing we see is a chance encounter. A chance encounter. As you come to chapter 2, chapter 2 really picks up right where chapter 1 leaves off. Uh, You may or may not recall but uh, or that chapter 1's last sentence sort of leaves hanging in the air that blessings may be around the corner for these two women, though they don't realize it yet. For these two widows, one of whom is a Gentile, and the blessing is right around the corner because it is indeed the barley season. In verse 1 of chapter 2, we again, we see this sort of uh, foreshadowing, this sort of glimpse as to what is to come Because we're introduced to a man, a man named Boaz, a man who is a relative to Elimelech, possibly a redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. But that won't be fleshed out for another two chapters. It's just a brief foreshadowing of what may be around the bend. But what the text does begin to focus on right away as we're introduced to this new character, this new man named Boaz, is the worthiness of this particular man. The text says that he is a mighty man of valor. uh, In other words, this is a worthy man. And that's the language that uh, of a mighty man of valor, you may or may recall, is uh, the same kind of language that David used of the 50 uh, fighting men. His 50 most worthy men that he surrounded about him were called men of valor. They were Mighty men, men who were named this because of who they are. Their character stood above and uh, uh, beyond all those around them. And so it's possible, even as you look at this, that there's a, that, that parallel between David's mighty men and Boaz is that he may have been, uh, had a military career of some kind, but truly, the text doesn't really say. It's not really concerned with his past but it's concerned with his present. And regardless of his past and who he may have been, he is a worthy man. He is a strong and worthy man. And most importantly, he is a relative to Elimelech. But the text sort of immediately pans away from Boaz and it again focuses in on Naomi and Ruth. And Ruth asked her mother-in-law if she may go into the fields to harvest some grain for them, to glean some food so they can eke out some kind of an existence. And Naomi responds in a, a, a something, some sort of noticeably short and terse answer. She says, just go. Leave me alone, daughter-in-law. Leave me to mourn my losses. Naomi's response is a, a, a very short. And it's clearly indicating that she wants to be left alone. She wants to wallow in her grief. And so Ruth leaves without any instructions from her mother-in-law as to where to go, where she may find grain, because Naomi does not believe that there will be any for her to find. Naomi does not believe in the goodness of God, so just leave, get away from me, get out of my hair, and leave me to mourn. And so Ruth, without any instruction, she goes and she just sort of wanders about looking for a field to harvest in. 
Now, what you see Ruth doing, what is uh, actually in accordance with something that God had established long ago, when he first brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. You see, in both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God commands his people not to harvest every part of the field. If you own land and you are bringing in the harvest, he tells them not to glean the whole thing, but to leave some along the edges of each field. And he does this for the fatherless, for the widow, for the stranger, an alien in your midst. That's the language he uses. You see, God is calling Israel to be compassionate to the stranger and to the widow and to the orphan in order to constantly remind them year in and year out as the harvest goes in that they too once were slaves in Egypt. But by God's providential hand, by his loving kindness and mercy that he has bestowed upon him or them, they have been brought out of bondage. They themselves were once aliens in a land of Egypt, as Deuteronomy 10 even says. And so God puts this provision in place for Israel, likewise, to show mercy and kindness to other aliens and strangers to the covenant, people like Ruth. Because God showed grace to them and provided for them in their darkest hour. And so Ruth, the text says, chances upon chance. She just happens upon the field of Boaz, this worthy relative. And you know, it just so happened that Ruth came upon this field and it makes the sound as though it's a complete coincidence. But the meaning of the text is clearly the narrator pointing out that God is providentially moving Ruth to this place to have an encounter with Boaz. He is arranging a meeting of these two. For not only does Ruth chance upon the field of Boaz, but Boaz happens to come out to inspect his fields as well. And as he comes out from Bethlehem to do this, This chance meeting leads to an unexpected blessing. An unexpected blessing. In verse 4, Boaz reappears uh, or appears for the first time, depending on how you want to look at it. But the very first words out of this man's mouth are, The Lord be with you. In a time, remember... When each man does what is right in his own eyes and has forsaken Yahweh for years, this man comes out and the very first words out of his mouth are, the Lord be with you. Peace be with you. Shalom to you and to yours. And here comes this man who is blessing his employees. I mean, they work for him, calling God to bring them peace, praying that God would never leave them or forsake them. And here before us, finally, in this text, what the text seems to be looking for and longing for is an upright man, one who walks blamelessly before God, one who truly calls his God, Yahweh, king, and allows him to be his king and over him and reign over him and affect everything and everything he does and who he is in his being. And that's what scripture is opening up for us to see here. That's what the Hebrew does. When you hear something spoken in the Old Testament, that is who they are. For out of the mouth, the heart speaks. And that's what the Hebrews do. Whatever their words are, that is what is in their heart. That is who they are. And so this righteous man appears on the scene. And he surveys his field and notices this Gentile woman. And it simply asks, to whom does she belong to? It's a very interesting uh, question, very interesting way to put it. It's not uh, what we would expect as, who is she? Or, uh, you know, what's her name? But the question Boaz is asking is, who does she belong to? What he's really getting at is, what group does she belong to? Is she a foreigner traveling through, or is she a proselyte? Is she a Gentile convert? Whom does she belong to? Does she belong to Yahweh or to Baal? That's really the heart of his question. Is she a member of the people of God, 
or not? How should I treat this one who is gleaning in my field? How should I respond? Do I send her away or do I welcome her? And the servant responds, well, she's a Moabite, which is true. She's a Gentile. And then he says, but she's the one who came back with Naomi. And Boaz, upon hearing this report, he goes and he speaks a word to Ruth. And he says, my daughter. Again, very pointed language, you'll notice. He, this Jewish upright man, speaking to a Gentile, says, my daughter. He doesn't call her a Moabite. He doesn't ignore her. But instead, he includes her as one of the people of God right away by basically calling her a daughter of Israel. And by so doing, he has done more to welcome her into the household of faith than anyone else has in all of Israel. He speaks to her as an equal, as one who has confessed her faith in Yahweh and has forsaken everything and everyone for the sake of her God. He counts her as one who has been added to the church. And he and she together share God's covenant. They together are God's covenant people. And in this way, he welcomes her into the fold of Yahweh. It's a very significant point about how the people of God are called to show kindness to the outsider to the stranger, to welcome the unlovely, to those who don't belong in our midst, who are not like us. And why is it? Why is it that this is to happen? Because God has shown you such love and kindness when you were strangers to the promises of God. How dare we withhold it from others simply because they are not like us, because they are different from us. Love the unlovely, show them mercy and kindness, for that is what has been done for you. And Boaz does this. He recognizes these truths that have been spoken over him, and he indeed goes out and he welcomes one who has been unwelcomed by this household of faith up until this point. And he does so, and uh, he does even one more significant thing than welcoming her. He blesses her. He says, stay. Work in my fields alongside my servant girls. It's all right. Come into our midst. I've charged the young men not to touch you. I've put a hedge of protection around you. Remember, this is the time of the judges when people do whatever is right in their own eyes. Assault in the field is a very common thing. But Boaz has wrapped a protective, uh, or his protection around her. And he tells her, when you thirst, drink your fill from my water. He does not owe this to this woman, but he gives her abundantly out of his mercy and goodness. Whatever the young men draw up, you are welcome to partake in. Be filled, be satisfied while you labor in my land. Boaz is saying no less to her than, you are one of us now. You are here, become one of us, enter into our midst, be with us. And it's no wonder that Ruth responds in the way she does. She falls down, she puts her face upon the dirt and bows before him. She is completely humbled by this man who has welcomed him, her, saying, how is it that I, a foreigner, have found favor in your eyes? Who am I? What have I done to deserve such kindness? Booth responds, or Boaz responds, Oh, I know how you, who you are. I know what you've done. I know how you've left your homeland, how you've left your father, your mother, everything that you have ever known. You have left your gods behind, just as our forefather Abraham did many moons ago. I know that you have abandoned everything that you were before you came here under the wings of Yahweh. And then Boaz blesses Ruth again, saying, may God, the translation says repay or reward, but that's really a bad way of translating it. It's not as though God owes Ruth something for what she does, but Boaz's meaning here is, is may God give you peace. 
May God bring you completeness. May he fulfill you. May he satisfy your longings. May your cup ever overflow with blessings. May he who began a good work in you bring it to completion. May he be your refuge. May he be your shelter. May he be the mother hen who gathers you as a chick under his wings. May he gather you to himself. And Ruth, again, is overwhelmed by this kindness and graciousness that he bestows upon her. She hasn't earned any of this favor. And she says as much. She makes it known. She truly is being filled and finding peace and satisfaction she did not expect to find. And surely, in the next few verses, we see Boaz making words or good on his own words, a blessing to Ruth. They aren't just words of well-wishing. He actually begins to demonstrate to her that God is indeed her refuge, that he provides for her and shelters her, and he begins pouring this unmerited and undeserved favor upon her. He even provides bread and wine for her, nourishing her at her noonday meal. Again, these are things that he is not required to do. All he is required to do in the law is to allow her to glean, but he welcomes her into his midst, calls her his daughter, or the daughter of Israel, and shares his bread with her, welcomes her to the table with him. And then, even more so than providing her daily bread, he instructs his workers to leave more on the ground for her, to pull it out of the sheet that you've gathered up and leave it lay for her to find, supplying not just her daily bread, but food to come for weeks. What you are seeing, quite literally, people of God, is that Boaz is holding life itself out to Ruth. He is filling her and blessing her far beyond what she deserves or imagines is possible. She is being made by his actions truly a member of the household of faith. No longer is it by her confession alone that she belongs to the people of Yahweh, but now she belongs in and with this people through the actions of this righteous man. God, through this seemingly chance meeting, is providing abundantly for Ruth as he blesses her beyond her wildest dreams. And this blessing, in turn, leads to a renewed confession. A renewed confession confession. In verse 17, the text tells us that Ruth gleaned from morning until evening, and then she went to beat out what she had gleaned. And she returns home with this ephah of flour, which is somewhere between 30 and 50 pounds. This is about the size of the large dog bags in the grocery store. Ruth is probably not a delicate flower. You shouldn't envision her this way. She has been working from sunrise until sunset, and then after the sun has gone down, beat out this flower, and then carried 50 pounds home with her. And as she returns, what's really the most significant reaction or thing that's going on here is Naomi's response to her when she returns. Naomi is absolutely shocked with what she sees Ruth carry through that door. She said, where did you get all this? Blessed is the guy who took notice of you. It's curious, that little phrase. Again, it's a little hint that Naomi still sees the world mostly in terms of men providing for needs. Not God. Not Yahweh. But after Ruth tells her what happens, Naomi changes. Her confession differs from what she said when he wa she walked through the door. She blesses Boaz, saying, may he be blessed by the Lord. And notice the next part. It's not clear uh, in the NIV, but the Hebrew is very clear. It says, may Boaz be blessed by the Lord, the Lord who has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi, for the first time, finally comes around the corner, maybe just maybe, God is good. Maybe, maybe he hasn't forsaken me 
completely after all. Maybe he still has a little bit of grace left for me. Maybe there's a little bit of loving kindness left for me. And Naomi is so changed that she begins to soften and you see her actually begin to instruct Ruth, things that she ought to have done when Ruth first went out. Now she is going back and doing. She instructs Ruth, stay with Boaz, remain in his field. It's interesting. Again, do what Elimelech and I did, did not do. We went looking for greener pastures elsewhere, but God is blessing you right now where you are. Remain where you are so that God may bless you abundantly. And notice even now how Naomi isn't being silent. She Again, she is instructing her daughter-in-laws, showing her the way that she ought to go, teaching her, saying, you know, this man is one of our redeemers. Instructing her, explaining her what is going on. And Naomi is being soft in her, in her view of an angry God by the loving kindness of a man who knows the loving kindness of God and who in turn has shown it to a woman he did not know from a land that was not his own. Naomi is beginning to see a new, a God who provides and cares for and loves his people. She is beginning to be filled. She is beginning to find satisfaction, both physically and spiritually. Naomi and Ruth a begi um, are beginning to finally move from famine to fullness. They're beginning to glean the blessings of coming into the covenant household of faith, of being in the covenant people. But the text ends promising more to come. And some issues have been provided for. Ruth is working in Boaz fields, and if she continues to work like this for the remaining seven weeks of the, the harvest, they will have more than enough to sustain them. But the very last verse suggests that fullness is not yet complete, that it hasn't arrived yet for her. God's not done with these things yet. For Ruth still lives in the house of her mother-in-law. Ruth's still a widow. She still has a large void remaining, remaining in her life. It is, is it too much to hope that God will bless these two widows with even more than he already has. And the chapter ends, leaving us waiting to see if God will bless them even more. Is their journey from famine to feast over? Or is there yet more to come? Can God satisfy them even more abundantly than he has promised and is doing so already? People of God, as we consider this text, it really, it really truly is a beautiful story about one man's kindness and mercy to a stranger who did not deserve any. And that is all well and good. But is there more to this story? I mean, ultimately, the food that God has provided for these two, it will be consumed and they will grow hungry again and they will find themselves in need again. What is it that God is showing us in this text? What is he demonstrating to us? Beloved, what if this story is bigger than Ruth or Naomi or Boaz? What if it's about how God has covenanted with a people and promised that he would provide all that they need, that he would actually provide them with his very self so that their longings would find their satisfaction in, in him? I mean, what is it that Christ came to do? Christ came and he was forsaken. He was abandoned. He was cast outside the camp. And he bore our sins and carried our sorrows in his very flesh and body. So that God would never leave us nor forsake us. So that God would never abandon us. So that he would draw near to us. Christ came and he provides for all of our truest needs. He truly is the bread of life. He is the bread of heaven. He is our spiritual nourishment. Even as we see displayed for, before us in bread and wine, Christ gave 
himself for us. He gives you his very self so that we might be filled and satisfied so that our cups overflow with blessing. It reminds you of Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, he who has nothing to offer, come and find that which will satisfy your soul. The son of Jesse himself. He will give you bread and wine. He will, and he alone will give you that which will satisfy. He will give you himself. And the grace and the loving kindness of God comes to us through a redeemer. We see it coming through a particular man, a particularly righteous Man, one who brings the strangers and outsiders to the love and mercy of God and that they may see it up close and personal. Boaz, through his obedience to the law, draws these two into the presence of God himself, into the people of God. But Christ does it fully for all the people of God, keeping the entirety of the law, fully obeying it in order to draw a people unto himself, in order to satisfy them. People of God, God provides for his people. He satisfies our needs, even when we do not know what our needs really are. He ultimately satisfied our greatest need by removing our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. And by bearing the penalty of our sins upon himself, he draws us near to him through his son, Jesus Christ, the righteous man. He has freed us truly from sin, from death, from bondage. And our cup overflows. Shall we withhold it from those who know we know are in need of it simply because they are unlovely? We're different. We're strangers. People of God, God has given us so much in Christ. He has given you so much that you cannot be satisfied or that you will only be satisfied by it. One professor who speaks of this love that surrounds us as uh, he's stepping under Niagara Falls with your mouth open wide, seeking to be satisfied, saying, I will drink it dry, but you cannot drink the love of God dry. It surrounds you, it encompasses you, is you, and it satisfies the people of God fully, filling you to the brim. May we indeed rejoice at this redemption that is ours by oath, by blood, and by covenant comes to us through the mercy and merits of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, for we know who we are, and we know our need of you. We know that we constantly look for our satisfaction apart from you. We go to dry cisterns, seeking to be filled by them. But you, Father, are the living water. You are the one who can quench our thirst and our desires. And we ask, Father, that you would do so. Continue to draw our eyes to Christ. Help us to be uh, satisfied in your love. Help us to see fully what it is you have done for us in order that we might turn and show your love to our neighbors. And Father, we... Pray that you would be with us now, that you would continue to grow us in grace and in righteousness. And all this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.